Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch podcast. And Ben, welcome back to you also. How are you? G'day, mate. I'm well. I'm well. You? Yeah, I'm good. You're sort of just out and about in the car there, mate. Yeah, out and about. Just, uh, yep, out and about. Let's just say that. I'm, I'm struggling with internet speed. Um, in the house that I'm in. So uh, I just thought I need to go and connect via my little iPhone here. And I've got a little hotspot going next to a, a Telstra tower. Which so, is, uh, so I could get this podcast done. Which is showing from... that uh, you're not in the office because of lockdown and all that sort Correct. of stuff. But um, uh, there's no there's no lengths that you're not prepared to take to uh, to, <laughs> to have a chin. Well, with the kids, the kids at home doing homeschooling, and it just didn't work, right? So I just thought rather than having a horrible um, opportunity for Stig to patch it all together when I drop out, drop in, drop out. So here I am in the car, yeah. Yeah, basically yeah. down the park. Yeah. Well, we, we, we haven't actually had a little um, chat about how, how rubbish your team's going, but uh, you, you, <laughs> you've probably had a couple of weeks grace on that. So you, you, um, you okay that the team's not going so well? Oh, no, you know, young side learning their craft, oh, you know, trying Come to get on. very, you know, we've got how many, nine new debutants. So, I left myself as open as a chemist for that. So we'll move quickly on for just <laughs> yeah. letting everyone know that um, uh, we, one of the best parts of our year doing this podcast, Ben, is the summer series because we actually get to talk to people who have implemented uh, the philosophies, the frameworks, the tips and the techniques that we talk about. So it's very, very exciting for us and um what we decided to do is we're going to do a um a, a short version for a winter series we're going to do four episodes and um we've got some incredible stories that we're going to share coming up and that's all because you are actually walking the talk this year um we get on this podcast and we talk about lifestyle design and you have had, um, as part of your lifestyle design for some time, mm-hmm. um, to take a little, a little, a wee little trip around the top end of Australia, and that's coming up. So it's all part of our planning for you being away. But um, yes. we're looking forward to the winter series, Ben. Yeah, we absolutely are, and that's right. We're going to sort of do some pre-recorded shows. But yeah, 18 years ago, I, I, you know, set up a plan for turning 50. And what mm-hmm. I wanted to do on my 50th year on this planet. And so um, I'm now in a very fortunate position to be able to take a couple of months of long service leave and go and execute on that, uh, on that plan. So um, yeah, looking forward to that. And um, I, I, can I, can I give away a little bit of the first interview we did yesterday? Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really, I'm not going to give anything more away other than saying it was incredibly refreshing incredibly empowering to mm. to those who who think that you know it's not possible well wow, yeah. i can tell you there's people who are making it possible and and they're doing amazing things so i can't wait for the uh, to record the other three and and see them come out over the next couple of months yeah good pickup and how 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 much were you buzzing yesterday after that chat so the first one we're on we're on episode 341 um so the first one will be episode 345 so about four weeks away um, so we're just getting that prepped and ready, but um, folks, uh, strap in. It's um, it's it's going to be a really really great series. And at the beginning of the year, Ben, I put a shout out to all of our community to set a goal uh, as a resolution to appear on our next summer series. So I just wanted to remind our community that that is still um, that is still a goal that I want you to set, and we will in a few months' time be taking invites from people who say they want to share their story because at the beginning of the year we asked you to implement money smarts and actually uh transform what's going on for you so that you can put yourself into a position to invest and so it's just a little reminder that if you're feeling like you're in the messy middle right now and that you started off strong and then life's getting in the way and in particular if you're in melbourne right now uh, in greater melbourne and you're still in lockdown things can just get a bit wobbly but just wanted to 
straighten up mind of the goal we are going to showcase some people who everyday people ben not not people with mm-hmm. balls, with um silver spoon in their mouth or you know in a privileged situation we're going to showcase to everyday people who have actually transformed their money and made it work and showed how actually how simple it is to do so just a little reminder about that hey earlier this week ben you also did your rba announcement that we send off to uh, our crew economic update yep via video but we also um get sticky she does a wonderful job of stripping out the audio and putting it onto our podcast platform mate rumor has it that might be your last one for a while what's going on well again um i'm not gonna whilst i'm away i'm gonna try and be off the uh off the computers off the off the technology so i'll be going into remote kimberleys and other parts of you know so i'm a camper trailer and a four-wheel drive so there won't be there won't be too much opportunity to check in on what's happening uh in the global economic environment so i'm, I'm really trying to um to basically go off grid uh for a couple of months um so yes i'll uh, just let everyone know that interest rates aren't going to change in the next couple of months. Mm. Um, the cash rate will be still at 0.1 or 1%. Mm. Um, so yeah, there, there might be a, the odd chance of, of, a, of an adjustment to the um, buying program on, on the on the bond the bond yield curve, but that's, that's about it, right? So there's not going to be much there. Um, the economy is obviously in pretty good shape and growing strongly. Um, so hopefully we won't miss too much. The, the biggest challenge we obviously have is, you know, these... Um, sort of random lockdowns, which which just take away a bit of momentum. But all in all, I think mm-hmm. the next couple of months will be, you know, sort of business as usual as people try to, and businesses certainly start to open up. So, um, I noticed yeah, you said try then, I ben. Uh, Yeah, I noticed you said you'll try and stuff the laptop. So that's uh, <laughs> that, that well, makes me chuckle. The, 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 yes, I, I still I still take an interest in in a few things. Like that's part of who I am, right? That's in my DNA. I'm I'm very interested in how business and world economics works and, and those types of things. I've got a little bit of a political sure. interest in there as well. So, so you, you can't take that out of me, but I'm, I'm also hopefully going to be mixing that up with, uh, you know, some incredible walks through incredible gorges and some waterfalls and some, you know, hot springs and uh, catching the odd barramundi. So I'm, I'm, I couldn't be a happier pig in mud mm. um, once I get there, mm. if, but I'm, I'm navigating the COVID situation to try and get there, right? I mean, I've still got to be led into WA and I've still got to be led into the Northern Territory. So that's mm. going to be interesting. Fingers and toes crossed. Hey, I haven't said this for a little while, Ben, but um, we're giving away some copies of our free book, um, yes. of our book for free, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the Armchair Guide to Property Investing. So if you if you want to know all about this lifestyle design thing, what Ben's doing, how did he make it work for his 50th? What there's, We've got some case studies at the back of that so you can see how it all works. So if you want a free copy of that, go to thearmchairguide.com dot au uh, head over there our publisher gives us some copies that we have in the office and for as long as we've got them um, we're happy to send them out um, to anyone who says look this is where i need to send it i'll pay for the postage we'll set we'll give you the book for free and um then you can read on what you're doing so uh well done mate for uh, walking the talk um i'm a little bit younger than you mate so i'll uh, let, let you know what I'm, <laughs> yeah. where i'm hey, going to well, be on my 50th oh, let's, in, in let, about let's, 20 years let's pump it up <laughs> <laughs> Pump it up. Q and A day today. Let's go. What have you got for mindset? Hey, mindset minute theme today, Ben. Is, yes, what um, we got. Uh, this is from Venus Williams, um, who is obviously, oh, for those who don't know, she's an American professional tennis player, former number one in both singles and doubles, and uh, widely regarded as one of the all-time greats. Now, she said this: "I don't focus on what I'm up against. I focus on my goals, and I try and ignore the rest." Mm. Which is which is really great, right? And I, I think. This is this is true for property investing, right? Because you'll be up against three barriers with property investing. First one is the vehicle itself. Does it work? Is this the right thing? Should I be mm-hmm. should I be investing? Oh, my friend said I should do. Oh, there's no money to make. So the vehicle itself, you're going to have some barriers. You're also going to be up against your own internal beliefs around whether or not you think, yeah, but that's all right, but that'll work for Ben and Bryce, but that won't work for me because dot 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 and all the all the excuses. And then you'll be up against external noise as well. So, um, so if you, if you get a bit wobbly, right. Um, and think about a pandemic that provides all three of those, the, the vehicle was a threat because everyone said property was going to, you know, cack itself. They, they you also started to wonder whether, you, you know, uh, if you had your own, um, the, the right drivers or the right mental state, when everything's going to custard and then clearly the external noise was huge. Right. So, um, if you are able to focus on the goal, then you can implement Venus Venus's wisdom and, and stay focused on the goal, right? Because um, one of the things that we do get from these from the winter series, and you'll see it when when we get to showcase it, is when they when they actually tell you exactly the the you know 
the pebbles in the creek to get across to the other side. The, those pebbles in the, you know, those stones in the creek, they're actually quite straightforward. They're like, oh, geez, I thought it might have been a bit more mysterious than that. So it's quite straightforward. So Venus Williams says, I don't focus on what I'm up against. I focus on my goals and I try and ignore the rest. So folks, uh, keep that front of mind this week. Also, I don't know if you're across the debate at the moment around um, Osaka, Naomi Osaka, who's pulled out of the French Open, Ben, because she didn't want to do after post, uh, post-match post interviews because of anxiety and all those sorts of things that are very real and um, a, a challenge for her. And so a journalist has asked um, Venus Williams, what, what does, you know, how do you handle the pressure of competing at an elite level, um, you know, with reference to that um, uh, post-match? And she goes, well, for me, and, and it's brilliant, right? For me personally, how I deal with it is that I know every single person asking me a question can't play as well as I can and never will. So no matter what you say or write, you'll never light a candle to me. She continued, that's how I deal with it. Other people deal with it differently. Whack. <laughs> Straight down the line. Well, it's, a, it's the man in the arena versus the, you know, yeah. what do they say about, you know, um, restaurant critics and sporting critics and sports commentators. This, the same sort of thing rings true. Can I bring this back to the pies? Mm. Oh, gosh. You know, <laughs> it sells newspapers, it gets ratings and all that. But in, in real terms, they're You're so rubbish. far from the truth and they're so far from what's happening internally. So, you just got to, you know, it's just an opinion of one person. So I think from, from that point of view, as is, you know, plenty of people who have podcasts and people talking about investing, some are opinions, some are based on statistical analysis. That So it, it is all people's views of and how they frame them up. Um, so if you can overcome those or, or as you've focused in on here, Bryce, just take the noise away and just stay true to the program. You're going you're gonna to survive and you're going to thrive eventually. There you go, Venus. Thank you for your wisdom. Today's podcast is Q&A day. We have got some great ones queued up. This first one is from Valerie and she is seeking clarity on the money smart system. Let's have a little listen. Hi, guys. Um, I bought this start course um, and I really love it. I'm almost through uh, the Make Money Simple um, book again. I have one question. How do I apply or how do you apply the money smart system to a couple? Uh, at the moment, we have something like we have separate accounts, something like twelve accounts between the the two of us. How do you um, change that to fit into the the system? Do you go with one primary account and two debit cards accounts and two credit cards accounts, or is there another configuration that you you recommend? Uh, many thanks in advance for your feedback tips, and um, have a great weekend. Thank you. So Ben, there's a there's a question there on um, some of the intricacies around uh, the money smarts. Uh, mm-hmm. In particular, how do you have um, do you have more than one debit card? Do you have more than one credit card? What happens when you've got more accounts? We have covered um, multiple accounts in summer series just recently. Yep. Um, but it's but it's also we get a lot of questions around this. So I thought I'd um, cue this one up because it's clearly a foundational part of getting your money in order. So. Um, Let's kick this off. What do, what do you have to, what do you have to uh, contribute here, Ben? Yeah, so a scene setter for those who are new, the seven-day float um, is how we try and control um, spending. We try and make sure that there's no unconscious overspending. Um, if you have a seven-day float and you have an amount that is allocated to a separate account, which is usually a debit card, um, we call that living and lifestyle. So that's the, that's the regular weekly expenses that are rolling week to week. And so that should include groceries and again, consistent regular spending that happens. Now, some people also put in, like I do, uh, entertainment um, and sort of uh, socializing expenses. And so with Jane and I, we have those in one account and we just check in on it. And that's the sort of, that's the standard minimum effective dose. Um, So we know we pay ourselves on a Thursday. Um, when it comes to Tuesday, if we haven't got much money left, we, we try and make sure that the groceries and what's in the pantry and all of that extend because that's where the slippage can sometimes be. Um, a lot of people uh, can struggle with the idea of, um, you know, not knowing that I've gone out and spent and uh, spent that money and then Jane's tried to go to buy groceries. So we always say buy the groceries first, get the food and all that in the pantry for the week. And so whatever's left over, whether you also add things like takeaway and as I said, drinks out with friends on a Friday or whatever that looks like, 
Um, that's If that's consistent every week, it should be in there. If it's not, then we should be looking at other means by which we, we look after that. So some people have decided to set it up where they have two debit cards. Um, so that's two um, bank accounts separate to the primary account. Um, and in, in a lot of cases, you can have that as an offset account. Um, and they separate out their, their so-called lifestyle spending from their living spending. And, and that way they can, they feel like they're in a little bit more control. Others can also, you know, if I want say $150 a week for my socializing account, um, that could be in a separate account. At this stage, Jane and I have that in a main account, um, but we buy our groceries first and then we, we work through that. So, so there are some, um, I suppose, uh, changes to a theme or extensions on the rules-based system that some people are introducing. That to me is still okay so long as you stop the, you know, the unplanned spending and you try and still focus in on that annual 12 month surplus. Yeah, that's right. And uh, my lived experience is Andrew and I have been sharing the one living and lifestyle, but it has provided some challenges at times. So yep. um, the, we, we are in the process of actually having two, um, getting yep. a second debit card, just so there's a separation of exactly what you said, living and lifestyle so that the lifestyle doesn't get um uh sl get slightly quarantined from from the living part of the seven day float but it's still seven day float it still allows us to go well we don't have to micromanage the spend all we're going to do is micromanage the balance mm. um, and make sure we don't go over the amount for that seven days but uh with with the credit card we use one credit card clearly um with two people who having access to it but it's just one credit card account and largely it's just for, for bills and emergencies. There's no discretionary spent use on that. So you, the other question you've asked here, Valerie, is two credit cards. Um, if you use it to its purest form, you don't, you don't need the second credit card because there's no. no discretionary spend. It's all part of provisioned um, for you. And the key part of that is having the auto sweep so that the amount gets paid on the due date rather than committing not only to your memory, but it's also another task. So um, I recently was chatting to a friend and they said, yeah, you know, I pay it off every, every month. I never pay interest. And I'm like, so they go, well, so why would I need to auto sweep? And I was like, well, just so you get that mental capacity back <laughs> so yeah. that you can just get on with getting on with it. Well, the, the, the moment that you miss it or whatever, where it should be just basically set and forget, that's the, that's the power of the auto sweep um, because it's drawing the money out of the primary account. And coming back to what you said before, Bryce, around um, to help people, if they're, if they're thinking about going to a second debit card, essential and discretionary. So that is the, the living and the lifestyle. So the lifestyle is technically discretionary. Um, the living is the essential. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, if you're sort of thinking, well, what should I put into the two separate ones? But I, yeah, it, it is, you know, if there's good communication around how you're set up as a universal household, um, there will still be occasions um, what's a good example? So where maybe I have overspent one one afternoon, um, you know, play maybe I play golf and then I've gone out for some drinks after that. And so that wasn't necessarily planned. Um, I should still use the living and lifestyle account for that. Um, so if it's if it goes over, um, what I'm what I'm doing is effectively saying to myself, how do I recover that position? Because I've got two choices. Mm -hmm. The choices is I forego that as part of my overall annual surplus amount. So the surplus target that I set for the annual period, if I, let's say I go over $100, um, I, I'm then going to say, okay, if that $25,000 annual surplus, I've now given up $100 chasing that. And then the next seven day float, that, that auto payment will go into that account. And I haven't done anything to try and recover that. Or I could potentially reset um, that, uh, that seven day float transfer on the Thursday to be $20 left less for less. the next yet less for the next five weeks and try and recover that that way so this is where you can do those slight tweaks when you do have situations where yep you know you're with a group of eight people and someone's got a shout and it's your turn for the shout well you don't leave that's un-australian you pay you do the shout and yep you know beer and so thing are expensive this day so it might be a 80 or a 90 dollar shout that's that wasn't planned for right so so we understand life life happens so that's when you can then make a decision in terms of whether you want to forego that or whether you want to recover it over a period mm. of time 
And it's a good visual you've created. You've, you know, you've got a bucket that you've got at the end of the year that you want to either be a hundred bucks down on, um, which will affect, which has the butterfly effect going forward for your wealth, or you, you recover it at 20 bucks a week or next week you think I'm having a really quiet one. Um, and you know, um, uh, or you, you, you could have thought, well, I better have a big, big one before lockdown happens last Thursday, Ben. And then you think, well, for the next, hopefully only two weeks you can recover it so so but the point the point of that discussion i think it's really key is to just not let it be unmanned slippage it's um yeah. it's it's an opportunity to, to challenge yourself to get it back as ben suggests so valerie great question hopefully that helps you thanks for oh actually we should cover off the uh, just quickly uh, the bit about the accounts ben you don't need multiple accounts we've talked about this before but for someone who's only hearing this for the first time the way you deal with multiple accounts is really simple you have a spreadsheet so if you have a, a holiday account and a Christmas account and a kid's savings account and all those sorts of things, just combine them, bring it all back into your primary and run a little yeah. spreadsheet tally that says that I've got 60 bucks in the kid's account. I've got 2000 in the holiday account. I've got, and so that the end tally, you know, that is sitting in there, but you've still got a way to manage and maintain um, little silos that you've created for, um, for those accounts. And some people, some people get away with not even having the spreadsheet, Bryce, because at the end of the day, as you do your annual planning, if that includes the $2,000 for the holiday fund and the, Christmas and the $60 gifts. and all that, then just as long as you're checking in every month, that money's in there. You don't, you, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's more around, I think there's, there's a great example of where you're, you're giving an allowance to the children. Mm. Um, then I would track that because it's just, you just, it's a, it's an easy, simple spreadsheet to build and it's not that hard or it's, or you don't even need a spreadsheet. So how many weeks has it been? 26 weeks so far at $10. Okay. So that's $260. That, that is Harry's money inside that, um, you know, $5,000 that's sitting in your primary account or the $20,000, whatever that is. So I think mm. that's, that's the important piece there. And also one partner, Ben, who might be, um, uh, if there's a partnership, of course, but one partner might be um, getting their pocket money each week um, that they can do what they like with discretionary yeah. and they're saving 50 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever. And, you know, you can leave that in the offset account and have a little tally there as well. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, for someone who's on 12 accounts, we'll, we'll, let's, let's, let's break that down slowly. Let's bring it down to a spreadsheet and then bring it into a provision. Yeah. Um, but basically you don't need to be paying all those can be um, a lot simpler and you can get your life back. Bank fees and you're also going to be um, doing well for the interest that you're paying on your mortgage if you have one. So good question, Valerie. Thank you for that. Uh, next one is from Kieran um, and has a question around land tax and different entities. G'day, Bryce, Ben, Stiggy and the team. Uh, my name's Kieran. I'm from Melbourne. Um, look, I was listening to your, your podcast a week or two ago. Um, and you spoke about an active investor, Bruce, who had land tax issues um, because he was investing in in the same state. All his investments were in the same state. I understand the active investor issues, but from what I understand, all these investments were possibly in his personal name. Um, what, what if Bruce was able to invest in different entities, um, for example, companies or trusts? Each entity would then be completely separate and hence reset the amount of land tax he had to pay. Can you unpack the issues as to whether this is a worthwhile strategy and are there differences with finance? I understand that commercial finance is required for companies, which results in less favourable LVRs. Are there any further issues that someone looking to invest using companies or trusts to reduce their land tax bill may encounter? All right, Ben. So another land tax question. We get a lot of these. Mm -hmm. um, so it's obviously a topical um, question for, for folks. Um, time so, to unpack it, Bryce. Time yeah, to unpack yeah, it a bit more let, detail. Yeah. Let's give a bit of a framework. So land tax is based on the accumulative value of all the unimproved land that you own. Mm -hmm. Correct. So the land, not the value of the, the buildings, the land, um, and other than your principal place of residence in any particular state. So now here's the, here's the drill, right? All states mm. and territory governments in Australia um, impose a land tax, except Northern Territory, um, that where there's no land tax at all. So that's the first hack. If you don't want to pay land tax, buy in the Northern Territory. But <laughs> in isolation, without a, a bigger eye on the prize, that might be um, cutting off your nose to spite and, and, and if you think that that's going to be that case forever, hmm. you're dreaming, <laughs> right? You're absolutely dreaming. Um, they'll come after land tax at some point. But keep going, Bryce. You, you started off well. So, so we're not propagating that you should not pay your respective land tax for your property because... 
I guess, you know, a longer term investment, um, the capital gains should outstrip the cost of holding the investment. So including yep. the land tax. So if you're paying land tax, it means you're holding a fair bit of land and ideally it's, it's, it's serving a great purpose for you. So we're not proposing that you do whatever you can to avoid it, but this question comes up a lot, right? So, but you should always consider the impact of that when you buy your next property. So there are four ways that you can avoid land tax. So let's um, let's refer them. One of the one of them is not really congruent with our philosophy, Ben. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna let you know anyway. So the first yep. one is super simple. Be a borderless investor. <laughs> yeah. So if you buy properties in, uh, so I'll give you an example. Um, if, I said it before. If you buy in the Northern Territory, there you go. But what about if you had four properties? So the the first scenario is you have four properties in Victoria. Well, clearly you would move through that land tax threshold um, quite quickly versus if you've got one in Victoria, one in New South Wales, one in Queensland, one in South Australia, or, or any of the other states or territories that I've missed in that example, clearly you'll be able to spread the land tax thresholds mm -hmm. that you have in your state. So that's the first one, Ben. Yeah, the second one, Bryce, is buy units instead of houses. Now, we know that it, it, this is where, it, you know, from, from our point of view, that contradicts our belief potentially for what you're about to buy. We want to buy assets that, that give us a constant return on investment. And so inside the unit market, there are different types of properties you'll buy. But the reason why a unit is lower in land tax because it's the proportionate of the land value is divided by the number of units in the block on the bit of dirt. So if you've got 100 units, you pay 100th of the land tax provision. And so that's basically why you would mi minimize your land tax provision. But again, we don't invest in property for tax outcomes or tax implications, right? We wanna, where, where possible, minimize our tax obligations, but where possible, get the best return we possibly can based on our financial position, right? And in terms of what we can afford to buy and hold comfortably over the longer period of time. But that is, another way in which you could minimize your land tax, but we're putting a big question mark next to it because it shouldn't be, okay, I'm just going to look for units because I'm going to save a thousand dollars or $2,000 or over time, three, $4,000 a year um, in land tax. It's not necessarily uh, a sensible approach. That's slightly not congruent because if you're buying an off the plan apartment just to avoid land tax, you, yeah. you're well and truly missing the game. Correct. But in some cases you, you may have a budget that wants to buy closer in where you buy you know, we, we, we do buy some properties, Ben, that are actually on yep. um, strata title or yes. um, obviously as part of a community, but they, they're usually older established properties that have been around for a while that have a track record um, that aren't new estates and they're usually boutique in number um, yes. as well. So very, very boutique. Yep. So, 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 and a lot of our clients have bought those and they've done really well. So it's, it's, you know, you, you could clearly miss the point if you get the wrong case side by of case. There's a classic case by case, hard to generalize on that one. Yep. And then number three, so that was number two, number three is, um, and I'm, I'm going to preface this by saying um, this requires you to get specific tax advice specific to your circumstances from a, yep. from a professional who deals in this, right? So we're talking generally, yeah. Um, because there's a lot of changes around here, but you can buy using different buying entities. So for example, um, Ben, you can buy in your name and yes. then Jane can buy in hers as can me and Andrea, right? Yes. And then individual. So that's a that's a land tax silo. And yeah. then as a couple, um, we can buy, which becomes another land tax silo. So you can do that. So buy a one only, buy a two only, buy a one and two uh, jointly, or then you can buy in an entity, which um, a trust or a company. So there's, there's cons for that too, right? There's complexity, there's a cost, not only to set it up, but the ongoing. And there are, in some cases, there are lending limitations. But the reason we're saying that you've got to get specific advice is because in some states and territories, you are not treated as a silo. You're actually treated as um, as a conglomerate. Um, yes. So, so they are tightening up on that, Ben. Yeah, they are. And I think this is a really important message, right? We saw last year and the year before, that the South Australian government implemented um, the conglomerate approach. Victoria has the conglomerate approach. So don't, f again, this is probably where I'm saying governments have a thirst for spending, right? They, they want to stay in power and, you know, to please all of the people all the time, they've got to keep spending money. Now that's money that they've got to raise from taxes. So they'll absolutely be looking at property investors as 
politically less damaging. We've seen the Victorian government do it down here around raising, um, you know, land tax and stamp duty because, you know, ultimately they say that politically it won't hurt them as much as introducing another tax that, that basically other people pay. So what governments have got to do and treasuries inside those governments, they need to find this money somewhere. And so um, they will be looking at what other states are doing and saying, oh, well, actually we could potentially do a conglomerate approach here and, you know, all of these wealthy property owners, they won't mind, um, you know, and we can start introducing a, a tax for them. So, so please be mindful, even if you are getting advice today from, from a tax advisory firm that might specialise in this area around minimising tax, um, what happens today um, won't necessarily uh, be the case. And, and I suspect when we are talking about some of this, that there, there, there will be retrospective elements um, in terms of as states and territories potentially start to look at this as a means by which they want to continue to raise revenue. I've said this before around raising revenue. The other one they'll, they'll look at, some governments, some, some different political parties will look at death taxes and those types of things into the future as well um, to be able to con continue to keep building a level of safety net in, as per their political um, values. So some, some want a higher safety net, some want a lower safety net. So that's, that's got to raise taxes. So I think that's important. And if I can add another one in here, Bryce, but this one, which is interesting for me is if you, if you, with inside a company or a trust structure, your thresholds are basically gone, right? So in your individual names, you get some thresholds, but in company and trust in, in most states and territory, you don't get that threshold, right? So it kicks in from dollar one. Now, when it kicks in from dollar one, um, you're also set up a, a, a complex structure. So ASIC have just increased the, the annual compliance fees for companies. You know, some almost, you know, I, I can't remember what the number was, but it was like a 300% increase in terms of the annual fee on that. Then you've got, you know, tax returns that are going to cost you, depending on which tax account you're using, let's call it from say $1,800 to $3,000 that they might charge you to do the annual tax statement. So all of a sudden, the two or $3,000 that you might've been trying to avoid for each individual property and land tax, because you've gone and got a structure like this, you're actually paying it anyway. Mm. You're just paying it to an accountant mm. as opposed to potentially, um, you know, paying it to the government. So, so I'm, I'm not a big fan of um, complex structures when you're first starting out and investing in property. I am, uh, you know, and I, I'll tell a quick little story. I am, um, when I was new to this, Bryce, and I was, you know, young and eager and into my early 20s, I'd read everything. I'd look at all these different structures of hybrid trusts and property investment trusts and all these types. And I'd be like showing this. Fortunately, I had a good accountant friend who he just sort of says, Ben, don't worry about it, mate. If everyone starts doing this, the government will change the rules mm. and they will stop you from doing it. So the best advice I ever had was when, you, when you're buying your two or three properties, just buy them in your name or your wife's name or those types of things. Don't get overly complicated into, and it served me super well hmm. uh, because I have seen, you know, back in the day, um, you used to be able to distribute money to your kids at $3,000 per child. Now it's like 300, so it's not even worth doing it. So there's all of these little things that have, that have changed over the last 20 years. And so I felt comfortable in those first stages of my investment journey where I bought properties in my name. I have a family trust for the business and, and I've got asset protection mechanisms around that. And if that's all new terminology to you, um, when you are potentially looking to build uh, a business or, or wealth, you do need tax advice and tax planning is really, really critical as part of that. But if you're a simple PAYG person who wants to build some passive investments on the side, I haven't seen anything better than doing it in your own name without all of this complexity. And you've got more to add to that, Bryce, around the lending limitations that you also get. Yeah, well, I, I was involved much prior to our days when we, we, we were building our business, Ben. I was involved in another business that, um, that was very strong at, at putting investors into trusts. And so it, it, I saw at the coalface the limitations that come from being um, you know, people can't see this on a on an audio, but I've got my hands really wide, you know, for options for lending in your own name. And then it becomes very narrow 
for lending options when you add an entity into it. So that's one thing. And then, of course, for some people who are pay as you go, um, taxpayers, Ben, the losses get the, the negative gearing losses get trapped mm. in a trust, which yep. they can't get access to. Whereas if someone has a business where they can distribute to that trust, well, then that can mop those up. So there is a bunch of complexity, which is why we're saying here's, here's the headline. Um, explore the idea if, if this is really important to you to navigate land tax and minimize that that go and talk to your accountant to navigate it but it, it doesn't come as a panacea to 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 solve it all because you might you might solve one problem and create another um, mm. in terms of getting access and then if you want to pull some equity out of it well if you're pulling equity out of a trust it's actually a separate legal entity so it's actually um, something that you need to consider if you can actually pull the equity out to invest to buy the next one and so there are there are some so I've, I've lived this experience uh, seeing it at the coalface with lots and lots of people trying to do this Ben and some and they do it successfully right but it just I've seen it I've seen it be a limitation so yeah, and I've for, seen some spruikers basically oh yeah you know really spruik this this uh, these structures because they're running an accounting practice that they make a fortune on in terms of getting mum and dads into these complex structures that have ongoing compliance work that that's how they make their money so again it's a buyer beware environment here um, we're giving you our opinion and our views based on on what we know and what we've seen over our last 20 years of of each of us doing this and and we're just saying that the rules do change um, but certainly as a hobby passive investment um, if you're buying two or three good solid assets that are going to complement your passive income along with your super for retirement. Don't overcomplicate it. Um, and you, I, and as we say, we're consistent on the borderless investing because that's how you can potentially minimize legally doing it responsibly, but you're not, you're also got lending options. You've got borrowing power advantages. So on the wash up of all of that, as a generalized statement, we are, we are really clear in terms of, um, land tax is a cost of doing business, but we, we, you know, that's the way in which we recommend mitigating it as opposed to, you know, trying to be cheeky and, and try and, you know, get through loopholes or try and get some type of fancy structures, which ultimately bite you in the bum in the end of the day. Just apply my mortgage insurance philosophy, Ben, avoid it when you can, pay, you know, pay it when you have yeah, to. So, love it. Um, and then the fourth one, Ben, this is not a lived experience for me because I'm a buy and hold investor. So I haven't yes. looked to buy and sell, but um, so I went onto Chan and Ayla's website. They're a prominent tax accountant. If you're selling a property, ensure that you settle prior to the land tax assessment anniversary. So they've used an example that in South Wales, that there's a peculiar anniversary date of the 31st of December. So if you were to sell your property prior to that anniversary date, well, then you wouldn't be liable for the land tax, but there's a there's an important footnote. You got to make sure you settle before that date because if you settled on the 27th and then there's an extension over that interesting time of the year and you don't actually get to settle until early January, you would be obliged to pay the land tax. So um, on your investment property, and that was New South Wales. Sorry, Bryce, you had a little bit of a lag there on your internet. So yeah, New just, South uh, Wales. New yep. South Wales. Beautiful. Thank you. So four ways: one, be a borderless investor; two, buy units instead of houses; three, uh, consider using different entities; and four be mindful of when the actual land tax anniversary lands and make sure that you can avoid that if that's an opportunity for you. But again, I'm going to say it again, you must have a detailed discussion with your experienced property tax accountant because land tax needs to be assessed with other tax outcomes like negative gearing benefits spend. So, and um, what, what's interesting for us too, Ben, is um, uh, we we are well advanced on, on our own tax um, planning business as well within our within our group um, because we see this as an opportunity for us to to help our clients over the journey to not only build the wealth but make sure that they uh, have superior um, tax position. So stay tuned for anyone who's interested in that. We'll let you know uh, a little bit later when that's um, when that's appropriate. So good question, thank you, Kieran, for that. Uh, next question is from Matthew. Um, this one is also on Speakpipe, and it's a question, Ben, around how do you buy assets closer into the Capital cities um, on a combined income of 100K. So let's have a listen. Hi, guys. Uh, I love the podcast. I uh, just got a couple of questions regarding investment grade and investment stocks, more for like people that don't earn that much money, say combined income of $100,000. So we've got a property that's got good equity and we went out and we bought another property for investment 
Oh, it was probably just investment stock in Truganina, so 20-something kilometres from the city. I know it's not investment grade like you used to talk about. However, I would wonder that how people on, say, 100,000 a year could afford to get into those inner city areas. I don't know if that's possible. And also in our given situation, having that we bought an investment stock sort of property, where do we go from here? Good question, Ben. Yeah, I, I like this question. And, and obviously we've been doing this for a long time, Bryce. So, and we talk about our first 20 episodes, right? And in those first 20 episodes, you know, some five odd years ago, six. we did really, six years ago, thank you. We did, um, wait, where did that year go? Um, <laughs> it's called a pandemic. Um, <laughs> so we were talking a lot about the inner city ring and and the land value in those inner city rings and and, you know, inside that time, those areas have gone obviously very, very well, right? You know, mm. th- those values have moved from, say, I remember, I mean, if you just even read our book, <laughs> you oh, can no. see some, see of, the, the numbers. some <laughs> of the the values that we put in those areas and where to look for. I think people reading our book today were going, yeah, right. Well, I mean, 10 years before that, people were sort of saying, and in the really good areas, you need to be looking at spending $500,000. Now, oh. those prob- <laughs> now they're $1.5 million. So, so I think this is a really timely question and an opportunity for us to continue to update our dialogue in this particular space. And this dialogue is this. Um, if, you, if you buy a solid asset in a good city location where the economic drivers and the sustainability of people who want to live in there and the population doing growing over the next 30, 40, 50 years, that historically that tells us that the trend rate, the benchmark rate for property growth in Australia is around that 6%. Now, some might report it at 6.5, some might report it at 5.9, but let's just call it six for really simple numbers. Now, if you're getting a, that, that is the capital growth compounding return per annum. So 6% is the benchmark, right? So how do you beat the benchmark um, if you wanna try and get an outperform result? Well. History tells us those inner city areas in, in, in a lot of analysis on the bigger cities, that could be 1% or, or a little bit more higher. Um, in some other cities, it can be a little bit lower than that where the income growth hasn't been as strong. So it is all, it, there's some variables in there. So, so all you've got to remember that if you're buying, let's say you've got $100,000 and cash flow is important, and we might talk about a balanced asset here, where you might be getting say a five to 6% return plus your yield, that is still potentially equaling a nine to 10 to 11% return. And if you hold that for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, that's a game changer. And if you rinse and repeat on that for three or four properties over that time, you are going to reach what Bryce and I refer to as financial peace. You are going to be able to deliver on a comfortable to very, very comfortable retirement and potentially have a legacy piece on which the next generation can build on. So if we set the benchmark at 6% long-term capital growth returns, and we then start to say to ourselves, well, where can we find that for areas that have property prices at 300,000, 400,000 regional, larger regional centers, um, city fringe locations or second tier capital cities and those type of things. They are out there. And so the, the message for those people is um, don't give up on your dreams because you can't go and buy that single fronted property in Richmond or that one in Paddington, or, you know, you, you can't get into Ascot or Balimba in, in Brisbane, you know, those types of areas, um, you know, th- that is true. So what we encourage people to then focus in on in terms of, because you can still buy in what we call areas that have a risk of oversupply or, you know, in areas where um, the, there is too much concentration of investment stock, um, whether it's very homogenic in terms of homogenized stock and there's no point of difference in the property. So your property is the same as everyone else. So how can you create that, that differentiator that sort of, attracts that owner occupier appeal, which potentially brings up the value of that or, or pushes the land value up. And so these are the things that we've found. Areas that have a lot of reinvestment and, and, and basically a replenishment of their land or people putting second stories on and investing back into that stock, that eventually finds its way into the land value. 
And what you'll find is some of the older houses are being bowled over, new houses are being built. So the old house that's been sitting next door for um, 40 or 50 years, whilst all of this other, they, that land value is appreciating, right? And so uh, the first time buyers or the people who are trying to get into those more affluent suburbs, they are trying to buy that property knowing that they're going to improve it or, or make it their own and those types of things. So I think from where I sit, it, it, it is just basically saying to people that um, try to avoid the areas that carry risk of oversupply or the lack of, of livability and lifestyle drivers in that area, because over time you would still be able to buy in the middle ring areas of cities. Um, and in some cases, even the older areas of the larger established cities that then have new estates that are built another three or four or five kilometers away from them. And that the ripple effect is real and those land values will mature at around that 6% level. And hey, that's, there's a living in that. There's, mm. you know, over that sort of 20, 30 year period. Yeah, well said, mate. I mean, when we pushed play on episode one, you could buy a single fronter in Yarraville for 620,000, right? You yeah. can still buy it in Footscray for 600,000. It's laughable now. They're all seven figure plus properties, the same in Sydney. So I think that's important because quite often someone will say to us, Hey, listen, you, you Geelong, really? You, your podcast, you know, 27 or whatever the number was, says that we should buy as close as we can to the CBD. Well, yes. Um, but we've obviously got to, we've got to, um, uh, flex with you know the fact that a lot of people can't afford a million dollar property that's on a, only getting a 2.7 percent yield on in in Yarraville for example or as you said Paddington so so that's in, that's an important point and and um, a couple of things I'd say to Matthew a hundred thousand dollar combined income is still good so let's let's not belittle that yeah. and yeah. the fact that you can you can you can buy um, properties that um, look you, you've, you've quoted Truganina. I'm not going to. I'm not going to talk about Truganina. I'll talk about near my own um, house, Ben, in Torquay, because there is there is a challenge at play here. Where at the moment you can buy land and build a house based on government incentives, five percent deposit. Though there's no LMI. Um, if you're in if you're in Armstrong Creek, for example, um, you qualify for regional, so you get a twenty thousand um, dollar. Uh, first homeowners grant versus the standard first homeowners grant. So there's lots of incentives to drive people to get into these um, scarce blocks of land because they can't cut them up quick enough. But if all you need to do is have a look around and see there is so much green land still available to be developed. So you've got, you've got the, you've got the scenario where in, the government's pumping incentives in driving demand. But then I also see a big, um, a, a, you know, a house that's been sold near the Marshall train station. That's, got enormous amounts of land that they will cut up and some developer will make a mozza on, which will release more land. So someone's saying, well, the, why are you saying not buying these estates? Because they are going up. And I'm saying, sure, they are, right, in the, in the mm. short term. But, but there's, they still do not have the fundamental requirement that we need, which is um, the lack of availability of supply surrounding it right which will which will continue to come on and equally they are in a lot of first home buyer territory so they are smaller blocks and they are as you said hom homogenized um uh, look and feel for a lot of the facades now i want to be really clear ben i am i am not discouraging anyone here because for some people they're buying into this estate it's their dream it's their first yeah, time they get on the ladder fantastic. all those sorts of things yep. so i don't i don't want to discourage that but what i'm saying is there is, there is a little bit of um, uh, challenging sort of data that says, well, this is rising, but we're actually playing a 10, 20 year game here. And so what you want to do is you want, you want to buy in areas that are already built out that don't have extra land subdivisions that can come as part of that. So that's one thing. And two, what you said is, is true, where you if you can buy established in these middle ring suburbs that are moving a bit further out, but people are moving there because of affordability, you still get that... Um, used to get that uplift. So I don't think that's a thing that you've um, bought in, in where you have um, done there, Matthew. Perhaps um, if you had bought it into an established part rather than a new part, that might have been a, an opportunity for you. But moving further and further out on these bigger cities is, is just a reality. There's demand moving there and it's something that we need to be mindful of. And very, very clearly... Um, Early, early episodes of our podcast were very heavily focused on saying very close to the CBD, but we've had to, 
you know, we've had to mature in our message around that based on the fact that the market has moved and for people still to be able to buy, it's important that they are, they are still buying investment grade properties mm. in investment grade suburbs that at the beginning of the podcast that we did six years ago, they probably didn't qualify quite the same, but now demand has meant that they've now moved into a, uh, a qualification suburb. And there's, there's one other element there, Bryce. I mean, ultimately, we talk about 70% of the market demand comes from owner-occupiers, but 30% historically has come from investors. Now, that peaks up and down a little bit. It, it might be a little bit higher over the next couple of years as investors see an opportunity in the market, which is great. Um, but one of the other things that's also changed significantly, which we've talked about over the years, has been borrowing power. So, so borrowing power has also meant that where um, traditionally you might have had a higher borrowing power because the servicing test was lower, um, serviceability test on the lending was lower. So you could have grabbed an extra couple of hundred thousand and that meant that, you know, instead of having a budget of say um, 600,000, you had a budget of 800,000. Um, that's now been pulled back mm. into a budget of that 600,000. So there's a lot of our clients now that we're working with who are going for their final property be it their fourth property or some cases, depending on how many good, you know, high value properties they're bought or whatever, who are going for, you know, their fifth or sixth, it depends on the personal circumstance. But the borrowing power they've got is now in that 400 to 450 range. Mm. And they're asking us those same questions. What, what do I get for 450? Mm. You know, what's, and, and we're sort of saying there are still opportunities and, and obviously we still use our demand supply ratios and we still, we still look at our scores across the country. And bearing in mind, there are some great buying opportunities in certain marketplaces in that sort of 400 to 450 range where there is evidence of affordability. So first home buyers are coming in there in droves, investors are coming in there because the yields are really good. And those areas can have really strong short-term capital growth. They can potentially pop in you know, and outperform for the next three to five years. And then they settle down back to their long-term 6% or whatever they get. So it eventually it eventually measures out. So there'll always be outliers. There'll always be a percentage of, of the market that, that get an outperform result. And there'll always be a percentage of the market that they get an underperform result. And the underperform results are usually in areas where the, the economic uh, variances in, in the economy in that localized area bring people in and then there's no jobs and they all abandon. And I think the best illustration of that globally is Detroit in America, which was the car capital of the world back in the 50s and 60s. And now Detroit, you know, it's economic. It was an economic powerhouse for manufacturing. It is no longer the case. And obviously everyone's left that area. And so, you know, the land, basically they give it away uh, and, they're, and they're bowling down houses everywhere because there's just no value in them because there's no jobs, there's no work mm. there. So what we are saying is, don't try and speculate on, on regional areas that have, you know, one or two industries um, where you could expose yourself. So, I mean, a good example of that might be Wyala uh, in South Australia, where it's all the steelworks and that steelworks has had a couple of owners recently. And, you know, so it's, it's just a bit dangerous. So we would say, be careful, uh, be careful in some of the big mine, the mining areas as well, because they have cyclical uh, booms and busts. Um, so st stay in your sort of top 50 population centres around Australia. Be mindful of the fact that uh, our population will move from 26 million people up to 35 million through these roaring 20s and into the 30s. And so there will be demand for housing, um, a solid demand for housing, and there will be continued prosperity in this country. And we're banking on that prosperity to also mean that house prices will continue to grow and it, that's what we're, you know, we're hoping for. And then the passive income that's coming off those properties is also going to benefit it significantly during retirement. And that's the way I look at it. There you go, Matthew. Hopefully that helps. The last part of your question was, where do we go from here? It's, it's no secret for us. If you actually have a plan that you know and you factor in these, uh, Ben said 6% is the benchmark. Let's put that in, um, work out what the yield is, work out what your income is. Um, give you a global LVR position. Clearly, clearly the data doesn't lie and it actually tells you what to do next. Um, so you may not be able to buy um, closer into the CBD, but that may not matter. Um, right. So it's all about achieving your Horses goal. Horses for courses. What you need and you don't need to have, um, what's the word? Um, well, it's buyer envy. You don't have to have buyer envy in terms of that. There is, 
there is good investment grade properties in middle suburbia, you know, that still have the fundamentals right in terms of the types of properties, the quiet street, the court, the walking to the public transport, the amenity that's around it, the, the schools, the parks, those things matter in every suburb as people are making their judgment calls on what they're buying. So we do feel that, you know, you can still do good buying in that lower range. Um, and of course, you know, those people who have very, very high incomes um, are, do have the luxury of, of, of getting some of those scarcer assets. And that's, that's, that's the nature of their, their situation. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't count out um, middle Australia to be able to, to be aspiring Australians and, and effectively start to build out their property portfolio. It's just a different blend um, and you'll still get a good return. Like if money's at one or 2% or two and a half percent to 3% and your investment returns are at seven or 8%, you manufacture that over 20 or 30 years time, you've built some significant wealth. And I think that is, that is the broader message. Good one, Matthew. Thank you for that. Um, this one is from Demetra. This is not Speak Pipe Band. This is via um, our website. Yep. And the question is seeking advice on an already bought property. Hi, guys. Love your podcast. I listen regularly on the drive to and from work and recently purchased your audio book, which was super informative. You always share a lot of knowledge when it comes to finding and, in, uh, and purchasing an investment. We would love more information on what you do if you bought a lemon. Most of the things you tell us to avoid applies to my investment property. The apartment was purchased off the plan in an area where supply exceeds demand and the property price hasn't increased since it was purchased back in 2017. And to make matters worse, since COVID and the bad publicity, new apartments have been getting, the property has gone down in value. There are tenants in the property currently and I have to contribute an extra 50 bucks a week towards the mortgage in brackets, principal and interest. The positive is that the property is in Sydney, 12 kilometers from the CBD and a 10 minute walk to public transport. This purchase obviously happened before I discovered your podcast, but what should I do? Should I hold the property in the hope that it will eventually increase in value? Or is there no other option but to sell and cop a loss? Any advice you can give would be much appreciated. Thanks, Demetra. Ben, we get a lot of these, um, mm. we get a lot of these questions, right? So this is just symptomatic of um, clearly some people who have bought some properties that, that probably wish that they had of had some of this information prior, but the problem, the problem with owning a dud property is, is there's a, there's a few things. One is uh, you could be losing money because your holding costs exceed your, your income from the, from both the rent and the capital growth, which would be yeah. um, awful. Um, you also lose the opportunity to make um, better returns elsewhere. Um, clearly opportunity costs, but not only that, just wasting time, right? You yeah. lose, if you lose a decade, that's a lot. Yeah. And then, and then the third one is um, the, if you, if you don't have equity and rental growth, well then your ability to not only have a portfolio that's performing well with this dud property, but also the ability to use the property to get the next one is diminished. So there's a, there's a, there's a bit to consider here, but um, uh, it is a very, very common question that we get. Yeah, it is. And it's, it, it, it is about time, right? I mean, the most powerful thing of investing into boring assets is time. Um, the power of that compounding return over time is, is magnificent. Um, the obviously other killer is inertia. We've talked about that before. So when you do buy a dud, this is loss aversion kicking in, right? And it's so hard, so, so hard to rip that Band-Aid off. It just hurts so much, Bryce. Mm. Um, because you've, you're effectively, if there is negative equity or... You, you know, you've lost your deposit, right? You've lost that opportunity. So um, I wish to say that there's a general statement for all of these, but there's not, it is case by case. So what you have to look at is what is the cost of, you know, the what is the current performance of the asset? And then what you need to do is look at what we refer to as your recycle costs. Now, if you're not familiar with this, um, there's, a, there's a website we've got, which is a research website called sellorhold.com.au. Uh, Go and have a look at that. You don't have to pay anything to have a look at it. Um, and you can see the recycle costs. Now, recycle costs are basically, what do I lose if I pull the Band-Aid off? Mm. Because um, your situation is going to be different if you don't have, if you lose all that equity position and you don't have a deposit for the next purchase anyway, then that's going to be a consideration of whether you just hold on. And, and, and over time, let's call it 10, 20 years, at some point, at some point it is going to grow in value. Mm. Um, 
But if your holding costs are getting harder, you've got extra, um, you know, special levy costs or things that are going to continue to see money flowing out and you don't see any uh, light at the end of the tunnel over the course of the next um, five, three to five years, then pulling the Band-Aid off basically then means what have you got left? What can you do with that money that you've got left? Is there enough there? Do you have to kick in extra? Do you have the ability to kick in extra, whether it be additional equity that you've got in your owner-occupied home to reboot and go again? Um, because if you can't go again, um, it, it is almost like, well, what's the benefit? What, what is the benefit in terms of transacting that asset? So I always look at it to say, if you can go again, it is very much an opportunity cost question. And then it is about, all right, well, I've got to sell this $550,000 apartment or a $600,000 house or whatever I bought. Um, can I get back in at that, at that 600 level or am I back in at 450 because I've lost that, a bit, that deposit and I don't have any equity left? How long is it going to take me to do that? And that's what these types of um, formulas and systems allow you to do in terms of running those scenarios. And there's a, there's a free report that you can download that, that does a deep dive in terms of then looking at other properties um, and you can compare the analysis of when you hit the break even point. So, cause that's what we're talking about. You've got opportunity cost, you've got recycle cost, um, and then you've got, okay, executing in a better location. When do I break even? And that break even point might be two years, three years down the track, but then you're back. So it, it, opportunity cost is, is um, something you think about when you've got the benefit of hindsight yeah. um, and there's no guarantees. And that's, mm. that's why most people uh, suffer from inertia and do nothing and they just ride it out um, because of that loss aversion, that, that ability to, 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 uh, to swallow that bitter pill because they also don't know whether the next one that they're going to buy is done to do any better uh, because there is still no guarantees in any investing that you do um, that it is going to do better. But we just look at the, the likelihood of people needing shelter and accommodation and those types of things. So that's, that's my... An, yeah, it's an important consideration, isn't it? Because if you think, yeah. well, I've more than dud the first time, how confident can I be that I yeah, don't buy a dud the right. second time? But yeah. there's, there's a few things that cause underperformance. One is timing. You might have bought at the wrong time of the cycle. You might have bought at the peak yep. and then you're sitting on it for, for a few years. Um, and it's just because you bought at the peak. So that's something to consider because if you've got a great asset, but you bought at the wrong time of the cycle, then time will do yep. some heavy lifting. Yep. Price, clearly, did you pay too much? Um, three, location. Did, did, you, did you buy an investment grade suburb or did you not? And then the fourth one is obviously the property itself. Did you buy the wrong asset? Which is clearly what we're getting here from Demetra around off the plan and, and all those sorts of things. Yep. The, save, the saving grace here is the fact that it is in Sydney. Sydney is more forgiving. Of any city in Australia, yes. Sydney is more forgiving of this asset than any other one because it's so dense, because it's so geographically bound by a national park, an ocean, a mountain range, and then all of the waterways that you have to get through. So Amazing it is- Amazing livable city with yeah. a population that's only going to swell as a mega city in the Southern Hemisphere. So, so for, therefore, um, if, if you were saying this was in Perth or Adelaide or Brisbane, um, that would be different. But Sydney, you know, that's something that you need to consider that, that it can come. So, so the question is, do you have a, cha- do you have a plan, right? Because um, can, can the property change its purpose? So you might have bought it thinking it was a growth asset, but it, it, it hasn't been a growth asset. But is it getting enough, you know, uh, non-cash deductions because of the high depreciation plus the yield that you're getting? Can it just change its purpose and be... A, a, a an income asset that you need in the asset and then in the portfolio and it doesn't stop you buying another one um, where you where you with your new knowledge and your new understanding you buy a better asset. so that's important for us to understand um uh, how do you how do you assess if it's a dud if you don't have a plan like if you if you don't know where you're going anywhere anywhere will, will, will be okay right so and is, is there anything that you can do to differentiate it um, compared to your neighbours? Like, mm. is it just so um, Lego uh, Lego land that nothing you can do just can differentiate it? Or is there something that you can um, do that uh, makes it worthwhile? Or again, in this case, it's off the plan, but w- what if it's just a really high maintenance property been in a good suburb that's a nice asset that's just a dud because it's costing you a lot? So yep. there's a few things to think about if you've got a plan. But for me, um, there's five questions you need to ask. If you're thinking about selling one, do you need the money, right? Quite often, if you yeah. need the money, then that, that answers, but you might not. You might be able to keep it there and see what time does. Two, 
is is the property performing poorly? Well, clearly in the in the details, we've heard that it is. Three is is it um, effectively capitalized? I.e., um, not in this example, but if you feel like you've got a dud property, but you could actually it's dud because it's old and run down. Could you actually manufacture some equity through it by actually putting a cosmetic reno in, or in some cases a structural reno in to actually uh, fix the property? Fourth question is, would I buy the property again today? Well, Demetrius told us probably not now that they know the, the fundamentals of the podcast. And then number five, are there any better opportunity, better investment opportunities out there? So that's a little bit of a framework to help you understand what you should do. But um, Demetra, uh, Sydney, 12 kilometers from the CBD, looks like it has got a lot, um, a lot going for it in terms of a location. Um, you're right. There is a lot of negative sentiment around this particular property type in particularly in Sydney, given some of the challenges that they've had. Um, so uh, I think the best outcome for you is where are you going? What is the, what's the roadmap that you're trying to follow and therefore assessing if this property has merit in that roadmap or not? And if it doesn't, then you go and do what Ben said and you go and work out what your recycle costs are, work out what the break-even point is, um, going to sellahold.com.au and giving yourself a bit of a sense, am I better off moving it on, freeing up the borrowing capacity, taking the hit? Because remember, if you're making a loss, it's a carry forward loss, which you would then, um, it's kind of like money in the bank. In some, at some point in the future, if you sold some shares or if you sold a property and you made a gain, you can actually net that off. Um, so it's, it's not totally lost. So that might become part of your plan. But uh, the, the important thing here is there is no general advice here that will solve everyone's um, scenario who's in, who presents exactly the same as you. Because you might have a neighbor who has exactly the same property as you next door, but their circumstances are so uniquely different. They do need the money and you don't, or they don't have as higher income as you. And so therefore the negative gearing, gearing benefits aren't as high. There are so many moving parts. So, you know, people probably get frustrated by us saying it depends case by case, but <laughs> it's so true that you yeah. need to have a plan. You need to know how it, it fits into your overall picture. The biggest, the biggest um, question that, that most people struggle with, with this one here is it's, uh, surely it's got to turn surely it's got to turn like 2017 so they get they get this um false sense of hope around the idea that it, well it, it has to move at some point right i've had it for five years and it's done nothing um the best way to answer that question is what bryce was talking about is once we know that does it fit the portfolio does it fit what your plan is does it help you with your long-term strategy if the answer to that is no then we need to measure the demand supply in terms of what's coming on. So there's easy ways to do that, which is the tools that we provide through selectresidentialproperty.com.au. That's one quick way of doing it. But the other way you can also do it is you talk to the council and you find out what's going to change, what's happening in there. And if there's more supply coming on, I can guarantee you that it's, it's unlikely that you're going to see strong growth in that particular asset for the next several years as well. So, so that, that is the point. Whereas if all of the, if all of the development's been done and that, that new community that they've built where they've built hundreds of apartments is settling down and there's nothing on the horizon and the, you, you're starting to see the demand supply measure uh, move higher in terms of the demand supply score, then ultimately growth might be just around the corner. Growth might be coming, but you've also documented that you're, you, you're probably going to have to wait till immigration starts to pick up. Um, and population starts to come into Sydney because at the moment population's getting out of the big cities because of the pandemic and we don't have that immigration story but when Australia reopens mm. um, which could be 12 months 18 months from now um, that those these property types given if there's not a lot of re reconstruction of that type of, there will be a moment in time where there will be growth um, mm. and the yields and the vacancy rates will go down um, it's just how long are you willing to wait for that um, it's a good versus... point, Ben. Demetra, are you 32 or are you yeah. 57? Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. are you 49? Like you think about Perth, my hometown. I've got some friends over there, Ben, who've had big portfolios in Perth for the last decade, done nothing, and now they're in their late 50s. Yeah. Whereas whereas the sentiment for Perth is pretty good right now. So if you're in your 30s, it might be a, a good yep. good part of the cycle. So it all depends on where, how old you are, Demetra. So again because you've got plenty of time to wait and then it's great but if you if you need some heavy lifting being done because you're at the the latter part of your accumulation phase before you move into your retirement phase that that's really crucial information right so um yeah. good question hopefully that's helped 
um, uh, you, Demetria, the, the, the big picture is you, you need to get some advice around where you're headed so that you can actually see how this fits into um, the overall picture. But um, all very good questions. I want to shout out, Ben, and say thank you to uh, Valerie. Uh, thank you to Kieran. Thank you to Matthew. And of course, thank you to Demetra for contributing to our show today. Hopefully that's helped a lot of people. And I want to encourage you to go to thepropertycouch.com.au and there is a little widget on the side, uh, speak pipe. You can be like some of our um, contributing guests today and we hear your voice. We love it. We want you to be a part of it. It's the People's Podcast. So come and tell us what your questions are. We get them all and then we can include them in an upcoming episode of the podcast. My life hack today, Ben, is in the world of Zoom. We're doing Zoom right now. We do a lot of Teams, Microsoft Teams. Um, quite often now, it's so simple in a meeting to, if you uh, can't be in a meeting for whatever reason, quite often they get recorded. I think even by default, um, some some platforms actually record the meeting by default. So I have a hack where, uh, at the moment, not true, but I drive up to the big smoke here from the surf coast and be in our North Melbourne office. And I use the time wisely, Ben, when I'm driving to make sure that I'm queuing into some of the meetings that are happening during the week that I haven't been able to, to be a part of for whatever reason. So I think that a um, uh, couple of things, there's two life hacks here. The first life hack is do not do this um, whilst driving, <laughs> do it whilst in a stationary position, but you might be commuting by driving on the train, cycling, whatever. Um, it's a good chance for you to actually listen to some of these meetings. And instead of sitting in an office um, doing that, you might be able to do it on your commute. So it means that you can spend more time um, being earlier and home with your family and getting uh, your work done, but also getting some lifestyle design um, in for good measure as well. So my life hack today is around being strategic about when you can listen to some of these meetings and see if you can combine a purpose like commuting. That's a nice productivity hack there, mate. No, I like that one. What's making property news, Ben? Well, I just thought I'd uh, do the the around the grounds. Um, we did see a 2.2% increase in property prices across Australia uh, based on CoreLogic's latest hedonic home index reading. Um, that was uh, in addition to the 1.8%. So we thought it was cooling in April, but really now we're looking back and they say, well, it probably only cooled because we had Easter and school holidays in there. And now we're back to um, to a pretty fully charged uh, property market. So let's go around the grounds quickly. Um, 3% in Sydney mm. for the month, for the quarter, 9.3% for the quarter, mm. annualised 11.2, total return 13.9. Um, big numbers, Melbourne, 1.8% for the month, 5.5% for the quarter, 5% for the annual total return of eight. Um, it, that's including the yield. Uh, Brisbane, 2% for the month, 6.2% for the quarter and annualised 10.6%. Add the yield on that, 15.1%. So Brisbane doing some very heavy lifting there. Adelaide, 1.9 for the month, 5.4 for the quarter, 11.8 annualised. 16.3% um, when you also whack on the yield. Perth, 1.1 for the month, 3.8 for the quarter, 8.5% uh, annualised, 133 overall. Um, some very healthy numbers when money's cheap. Hobart, 3.2% for the, for the month, a uh, big number there. 7.7% for the quarter, 16.5%, 22.1% uh, for the annual, um, big cash cow there. Darwin, 2.7 for the month, for the quarter, 7.9, annualised 20.3, and <laughs> add the yield in there, 26.9. Mm. Now, this is a good example of that, that Adelaide, uh, Darwin and some of these smaller, really, towns that aren't bigger than, say, Geelong, you know, these, these cities are smaller than Geelong, Newcastle, plenty of Gold Coast, plenty of locations around. So don't, don't be too overwhelmed by those numbers. But they also have plenty of stagnant time, Darwin and Perth mm. being good examples, pretty much flat for the last eight years. So basically uh, picking up uh, momentum there. Canberra, 1.7 for the month, uh, 6.5 for the quarter, 15.6 um, for the annual and 20% overall. So just some solid numbers there um, when it comes to uh, to the capital growth story um, and more to come. But uh, I'm a bit like what Tim Lawless, the head of research at Core Logs, is saying. It's unsustainable at those higher levels, um, but we still believe that, you know, there's plenty of this momentum to run. Um, we're, we've only seen probably the first um, uh, quarter, third quarter to a third uh, of growth so far in this cycle. 
Um, and as the economy continues to open up, um, we do expect that the property price is going to continue on their merry way well into uh, to 2022. So, um, you know, really, really solid numbers there in terms of what's making property news, Bryce. Good rep, Ben. Thank you for that. Uh, there you go, folks. Hopefully that's been a great episode for you in terms of hearing some of the questions that our community has. And hopefully you got some of your questions answered as well, mate. But uh, until next week. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. There you go, folks. See you next week. Hey there, folks. Bryce Holdaway here. Before you go, if you're new to our community and only listen to maybe a handful of episodes, I thoroughly recommend that you go all the way back to episode number one, where we unpack all of the foundations when it comes to property investing. Now, for those of you that might be a little bit time poor, I've got good news for you. We have a binge guide that you can download straight away, which summarizes the first 20 episodes where Ben and I unpack the foundational pillars of the A, B, C, D, and so much more. And you can get that straight away. If you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20, you can download it and consume it whenever you want. It's completely free and available now. And for those of you, just a quick reminder that nothing we've spoken about today constitutes financial advice. We recommend that you reach out to your licensed professional advisor so that you can look at your unique circumstances before acting on any information. Now don't forget, go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and get your binge guide today.